Could you please call order? The roll. Ms. Arnold? Here. Ms. Hunt? Here. Mr. Morrison? Here. Ms. Regano? Here. Mr. Taylor? Here. You have a quorum. Please stand for the flag. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, and then that little orange uh, letter there beside us to see that does represent the score from last year. Uh, again, achievement for this year is B. Now, I don't expect for you to be able to read all of this information, but color coding really matters. What I wanted to share with you in this particular slide is a, a proficiency comparison. Again, this shows all of the tested areas beginning in grade three all the way down to our course exams. And what you will see here is a three-year trend um, for each of the, the grade levels, or each of the tested areas, uh, going from 1617 to 1718 to 1819. Uh, <clears throat> I want you to, to see, first of all, that on this particular slide, the areas in green and red indicate where we did meet the, the indicator for the state report card. The areas in, in green are indicated that we passed, and red we did not. So again, it's a visual for you to see kind of where along the lines we, uh, we were successful in the state report card this year. This next slide looks similar but different. Um, same concept in red and green. In this case, what we're referring to here is, is the um, increase or decrease in percentage of proficiency from last year to this year. So again, as you read down the list here, grade three all the way to the course exam, if the numbers are, are indicated in red, it's a decrease in the number of students proficient. Uh, it was red, it was, I'm sorry, it was green, it was an increase. So again, it's a visual to show where we are making gains and where we have, have seen slight decreases. And they are slight decreases um, in the red areas from this past year. When you look at a comparison over the last few years, you can see that the indicators not met is, is continuously decreasing. We uh, had 10 indicators not met two years ago, to seven indicators not met this past year. In grades three through five, the only indicator that was not met was the fifth grade math. Again, as a district, it was only fifth grade math. It's a three-year decline, uh, slight three-year decline. And we're, what we're really measuring here is the fact that our, uh, we're looking at fifth grade students that are on grade level. Just a reminder to, uh, to all of you that our students in, in math are being tested at where they are in their educational progress. So we have fifth grade students taking the sixth grade math test. We have seventh grade students taking algebra one. So we have this kind of, based on where, what student or what courses students are taking, they're being tested in that area, which means we do have fifth grade students that are not testing in fifth grade. They're taking the sixth grade test. Um, again, that's their, that's where they are on, on their level. So it is something that is, is an area of uh, focus to look at um, as, as a district. In grades six through eight. Can I ask a question? Yes. So I'm just having just had a fifth grader. I know that recently we changed, but made that change. So could the decrease be attributed to the fact that the kids are being tested differently now than they used to be? Because they weren't taking like math six before, were they? Uh, this has been for a, a few years now. Um, and, and what, so if you're looking at just our fifth grade students, we have a number of students that are out of the fifth grade class not taking the fifth grade test. That is right. true. So the fifth grade indicator is for those students that are testing on the fifth grade test, which means that some of our students, again, are taking the sixth grade math test and therefore are counting in the sixth grade indicator. So I'm wondering, did it negatively affect them fifth grade? Well, it, it depends on how you look at that. If you had all fifth grade students taking the fifth grade test, then, then the indicator would look different. But because our students are taking different courses at the fifth grade level, it, it is measuring those fifth grade students that are on grade level. And so it does show a, uh, it may look as though it's a decrease, but it's, again, it's the way in which we're testing students looks different. And our focus really is on our fifth grade kids that are on grade level on the fifth grade test. Uh, grade six through eight, three out of the seven indicators not met. Uh, that was in ELA, uh, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, and eighth grade math. So again, when we start looking at areas of focus, this would be an area uh, district-wide for us to take a look at. And on the seven and the course exams, um, we had, had six of the eight indicators. And this is an increase of one indicators met from 17 through 18. And also note here, too, that one of those indicators that was not met was the integrated math. Um, just so that you are aware that those integrated math uh, scores are coming from the Greenwood County Career Center. They are Beaver Creek kids, but those are Career Center students. Uh, they took the integrated uh, 
not a test. So again, this is just an overview of district-wide of achievement data. And I'm gonna turn it over to Bobby at this point to talk through some of the, the other indicators. The next indicator is progress, which is um, another word for that is value added. So it is the amount of growth. The progress for all students is, is measured in this um, component. So overall, we got an A, which is great. That's what we had last year. Um, and then if you look at gifted students, we also had an A. Students in the lowest 20% of achievement, and that is statewide. So they look at the kids that fall into that group are in the lowest 20% so if the, the amount of kids you have in that can change your year because it's based on where the lowest 20% is. So that is an A. And then students with disabilities was a C, and that is a decrease this year. I believe we had a B last year, so that's something to look at. Um, I do want to let you know that when you get a C in progress, that means you met expected growth. So C is expected growth, and A or B is more than expected growth, which is on the next slide. So if you look at that, so just thinking about it, a C is expected growth in a year, and then A and a B is above expected growth, and a D and a F will be less than expected growth. So just something to consider. Um, other components are the gap closing. Gap closing, we received an A. Um, this is how well the schools um, and, and the subgroups, so there are subgroups. So each school will have, you'll hear them talk about a different subgroups. So they'll all have all kids, they'll all have white, then some will have economically disadvantaged, some will have, they'll all mostly have students with disabilities. A subgroup is made when there is more, about 20 or more kids. So there's 20 or more kids that fit that um, subgroup, then they get a score report. So what it is is it's looking at the amount of kids in that subgroup, did they meet their target of percentage pass even test? So for that, overall, we received an A. So, and if you look, those are our subgroups, but it'll be interesting if you get the principals hit on this at all. There's not as, like everyone doesn't have economically disadvantaged subgroup. Everyone doesn't have Asian or Pacific Islander. So there are subgroups in different schools based on the makeup of their students. So, uh, graduation rate is another component, and we received an A in that. Uh, prepare for success is something that uh, we did get a C in, so relatively this would be an area that we're going to target talking about soon. Um, in order to receive uh, points for prepare for success, students have to meet three, one of three criteria. They have to have a remediation free ACT score, meaning they have to meet a certain number on the ACT or SAT. Okay, so a remediation free score, those are set by OPE. Or an honors um, diploma, or uh, uh, industry credential, like an industry credit um, credential certificate. So, if you meet one of those three, then you get bonus points for things like CCP, taking dual enrollment, or um, getting a score of a three on an AP exam. But if you don't meet one of those three, if you do the other things, it doesn't matter. You get no points. So when looking into that, you know, looking into how can we improve that, you have to look at those three basic qualifiers and how do you get more kids to get points in that in order to get the bonus points, because we do have a lot of kids that take CCP, but if they don't meet one of those qualifiers, then we don't get points. Um, so if you look, we did go up from a 61.3 to a 62.5 um, overall. Uh, improving at-risk K-3 readers, we were not rated for that. Um, in order to be rated, we were not rated because we had less than 5% of students that were not on track. So we did not receive a rating, which is a good thing. 99% of our third graders met with the minimum <coughs> guarantee requirement, either through the statewide, um, the statewide assessment or the alternate assessment that they allow you to do. So a uh, summary for us as a district would be as a positive as we increase two indicators in achievement. We have a value added rating, which is the progress rating of an A, meaning more than expected growth for all kids. Uh, gap closing, all of our subgroups uh, met their target, so that's good as well. Uh, targeted areas would be fifth and eighth grade math. Um, Jason hit on that a little bit with, uh, you know, a lot of fifth grade kids are taking sixth grade math, a lot of, um, Eighth grade kids, more than two thirds are taking the algebra tests. So, and then there's some taking geometry. ELA is sixth through eighth grade. Um, ELA is sixth through eighth grade is a target group as well. 
And then prepare for success, what I just talked about. Um, a targeted area would be that number of students who need the remediation pre ACT score. Kylie and I are digging into how many kids did we have that were one point from that? You know what I mean? And how, what can we do to get that ACT that remediation pre score? And then working with the Career Center on the industry recognized credential. So, um, just some things that we're doing for achievement is building department and grade level data analysis meetings throughout the year. That started on our PD day in September 20th, and then on October 14th, and throughout the year. Uh, professional development targeting instruction and barriers to learning. We really emphasize this year those trying to remove those barriers to learning, the social emotional pieces. There's a lot of PD set up for that. Um, Trauma informed teaching, things like that. That are there's some kids coming to school with a lot more needs than just um, being behind academically. So removing those barriers and then prepare for success. Looking at the ACT preparation for students to try to meet that remediation pre score and the collaboration with three members. Those are some things we're going to target this year to try to improve those two areas. And turn it back over to Jason to talk about similar districts. Our final slide for tonight really is a similar district comparison. And as all of you know from our uh, meetings that we have uh, last year, the, the 11 that we went out and did throughout the community, one of the things that we really focused on was our similar district comparison. And the ODE 20 similar districts, as we've talked about, are a fantastic list of school districts. We would all be proud to live there, work there, or have our students attend any of those districts. Um, this is a slide, once again, difficult to read because there's lots of information. We certainly can make that available to you. Um, we have our districts across the top, and it just has the overall uh, ratings in lots of different areas on the state report card, along with matched up uh, same information from all of our ODH1. Um, one thing just to kind of point out to you is our most similar district, as we all know, is Centerville. So, of course, that is the first line on our, our list comparison sake, and as you can tell, we could we could fare uh, very, very well in comparison not only to Centerville, but to our other uh, ODE similar 20 districts. Other items to, to point out, again, from all of these similar districts, we are one of 14 districts that have obtained a B um, from the state report card. There are a few A's sprinkled in there, as well as a couple of C's, but the majority uh, certainly have a, a greater B on their state report card. We are one of just six school districts that met the gifted indicator. That is quite a feather in our cap as a, as a school district, not only in our ODD Summer 20, but we are we believe one out of 52, if I'm not mistaken. I think mean, Beth is on your head back here. One of 52 in the state that did meet the gifted indicator. And once again, that's just a matter of uh, identifying and serving our students that are identified as gifted. Um, you can see lots of uh, growth there in, in the progress area that Bobby talked about, uh, lots of A's across the board, gap closing, graduation rate. Notice that we are one of very few districts in here that uh, was rated, or not rated, I'm sorry, for the K-3 literacy. Again, that, that is also a good thing um, related to how well our students are <coughs> uh, those that are the percentage of students that are not on track. So that is a, a good indicator for us as well. You can also see, as Bobby talked about the prepared for success, it is a bit of a struggle uh, for all of our school districts. Uh, again, the way that calculation uh, is constructed makes it very difficult for, for school districts to get that indicator. Uh, again, when, well, while we're really only concerned about ourselves as a district, it is also important to take a look at what other school districts are doing, just so we can start to see where the comparisons are and how we can more from other school districts. So it is good information to, to look at. Uh, one item that is not on here that I'd like to share with the board is that one of our one of our state uh, news outlets on the night that this information was posted uh, did a comparison of school districts in the category of performance index. Ranked them from one to 613, 608 school districts. Um, we were ranked number 85th in the state on performance index. Um, again, we'd like to compare ourselves to uh, our most close, com our most close comparable district, Centerville, uh, was 142. There were other local districts that were ahead of us, but again, as, as most of our these, uh, we, we fare very well. So it is good to share that information and tell a positive story 
Um, again, as we are proud to say, we are one of the great school districts in the state of Ohio. And, um, the data does, does bear that out. We, we have a lot of successes. And as we've indicated tonight, some areas for focus and how we go about trying to improve on those focus areas. So, with that, uh, again, as, a, as an overview, certainly welcome to welcome any questions, but uh, if there are no questions, I'd like to start turning it over to our, our buildings. Uh, you know, we're, they're all sitting there a little anxious probably to get started. Um, this is a reminder to all of you, here are the parameters we kind of shared with them. We've asked them to share a five to seven minute overview of the growth or the strength areas of their building data, their areas of focus, and the, the ways in which they are looking to address those areas of focus. So uh, we can all go on and on and on and share of that. But uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our high school. Uh, Assistant Principal Laura Bailey is here tonight to uh, share with you. And we will continue with Ferguson Hall next, then our Chino schools, and we will follow up with our own this evening. So again, thank you very much for allowing us the opportunity to share this from our I'm Laura Bailey, one of the assistant principals at the high school. Uh, this is my third year in the district, and I quickly learned that small, fine print line in your job description that says all other duties are assigned. Um, this would fall into one of those all other duties that we assigned. So I am lucky enough to see it and present some of our data in the high school this year. Again, we're going to look at a quick, brief school overview here, and Jason had kind of alluded to some of these items as well as Bobby. Um, so this is general overview, school overview of what the high school looks like. I'm going to kind of um, dive into a couple of those different areas and, and point out some important points along the way. Um, when I first started here, uh, two years ago, no, three years ago, I guess, um, when I came in, I come from a, I've been in several other districts. So when we started coming in, we started talking about data with um, the high school staff. It was, we found everybody was kind of in a different along the continuum of the data that's collected, how it's used, how they understand and interpret that kind of um, data. So one of the big things that I always like to point out when we're looking at data or test scores or anything like that, and they both talked about value-added scores versus achievement scores. Um, this was a big um, point that we needed to identify for our teachers and staff. The fact of achievement is proficiency, and we've given you there the different levels the students could that proficiency we look at as a um, but then that is completely different than student growth and progress. So a lot of our teachers, when they were reading their data, were thinking, okay, well, my students were proficient. Why is my value added not equaling to what I'm seeing for my proficiency data? Um, so the big thing with them was kind of this mindset, mind shift, that student growth does not necessarily mean proficiency. So when we look at a student in their base level where they're starting, yes, we want them to be proficient in the material and on the test. But the bigger piece of that is the student growth itself. So when you're talking about value-added scores, it's did the student here meet their predicted um, achievement for that year? So that was kind of a, a little bit of a misnomer for the staff, just, just trying to put those on a level playing field so they understood the difference between achievement and proficiency. Uh, or I'm sorry, achievement and progress. So that's something that's been a work in progress with our staff. Um, and I think they, they're slowly understanding and they still are frustrated if their students are proficient, but you know, they're, they are EVOS so their value added and may not be what they had expected to be. So in, ter in talking of, in terms of focus, that will be something we continue to work on. Um, finding our students where they are and how we get them to where they're predicted approach. Um, so this is kind of tiny, but I'm gonna, I really just put this up here to show you, these are all the different um, tests and of course tests that our high school students are exposed to. Um, and I'll go through some of these a little more closely, but really I wanted to, and Jason had alluded to some of this as well, if you look at the geometry on the far right um, up there, the school is in red, and then the district is in blue, the state is in yellow. Geometry is something we've really struggled with, um, so it's, a, it's an area of focus, and it will soon be shifting out of geometry testing, so we're, we're kind of looking at that piece as well. Um, but there where you see the school and the district, we again have um, students, typically they take geometry in the 10th grade, but we have some students in 
eighth grade, I don't know if we have any in seventh, seventh, eighth grade, ninth grade that are all taking geometry. So the reason you see a higher uh, percentage there for the district level, that is including all of those kids who are accelerated and taking that geometry test. The red there indicates that those are our typical grade level sophomores that are taking the geometry test. Um, I, I like to see this when our numbers are always higher than what the state you know, average was. So although geometry is focus area, um, we were slightly above the state average for this year again. So it's always good news give, a, give the teachers a bonus to kind of run that. Uh, these are the breakdown then of the indicators that were met. A couple of things I wanted to point out that the algebra one, again, those are students who could not successfully either can complete the year of algebra in uh, one school year or their students who are now sophomores still looking at taking an algebra test. And I just mentioned, some of our students are taking geometry and algebra at the same time. So for our students who really struggle with math, that's, that's a heavy burden to carry for a lot of them. Um, again, that state average for proficiency for geometry there, we were at 49.5 for the high school, 44% uh, for the geometry, and of course, state average. So yes, we're higher than the state, but we'd love to see that number be much higher, obviously. Um, but if you brought, if I brought any geometry teacher in here right now, and I've seen the geometry test, they would tell you this test is incredibly difficult. Um, just the application based behind the geometry and the different standards. And I'll say cautiously, is it an unfair test? Some of us probably think so. Um, but nonetheless, our, our our students did score above the uh, the average of the state there. The mathematics too, Jason had talked to us about those being some career center students. We also have students take math too in our grad point program. So those are students who have not necessarily been successful in a normal school setting. Um, and we also, a move-in student that we need to satisfy another math credit to, we often put them in the math too. And then I know we had talked about, um, I've been talking to Beth recently about the, the gifted stuff and we're trying to get our teachers to meet their required gifted hours for the year. PBL um, has been a big push in the district and a lot of our teachers will continue that um, to, to receive their gifted hours and training. Just a couple other things here with the, the testing. When we, our geometry and our ELA test scores, so I'm gonna go back to geometry again. We, as you know, we have a lot of move-ins, move-outs in the district. And there are a ton of kids that move in from out of state that are, don't have those same testing requirements. So any student that moves in from out of state, we must give them the geometry and ELA2 test so they can kind of be included or wrapped into that whole graduation um, process of points and things like that. So we could be testing these students in geometry and they may have taken geometry their freshman year um, at their previous high school. And we may, if they move into us as seniors, we are testing them as seniors. So although we would, you know, love to, I'm a former math teacher, I want to say everybody remembers math, but you know, it, it, it's, it's not the case. So I just wanted to point out those couple of things, um, that there is some gap time in between when the students who have been have taken the course and now when they're actually taking the test. And the gifted indicator here I wanted to talk about because we were so close in the high school. Um, we met the value added there, the gifted inputs, and then when we look at that gifted performance index, if you notice, we needed to have a 117 um, or better, and we ended up with a 115.031, so, so close. Um, but I did just want to point that out to you as well. That's something we are going to continue to work on, um, and I'll kind of get to that in just a little bit. Jason had said, you know, kind of the power of different colors on your slides and things like that. So we are looking back from proficiency back from 2015-16. Uh, if you notice there, the indicators that have been passed um, has, well, aside from that 2016-17, um, has increased dramatically if we're looking at 2 of 7 to 6 of 7. So I think that's a real high note for um, our building and our district as a whole. We are improving, and there are still some areas that we are going to focus on but I wanted to show you how big that, um, the growth and the distinction here is for our kiddos and our teachers. This is a slide that I can show the teachers, I think, that really resonate with them. We use this the first day of, you know, their first meeting back, and, you know, you look 
at all the things you want to improve, but we also have to celebrate the successes that we have. And this is a big celebration for them. So our areas of strength, um, just end of course buy-in altogether. Um, it was a shift, I know, when Yvonne Edwards came in and she was looking at end of course testing and, and the emphasis that was placed on that. There's always been emphasis on it, but over the past couple of years, I feel like we've really gotten that message out to parents and students. For students, it hits home now when they look at their graduation requirements. You know, and They were like, oh, these tests don't mean anything. So now they're juniors and seniors, and they're like, oh man, that test really, really meant something. Um, so we have more student buy-in, the teacher buy-in um, kind of goes along with that, pointing out the data points, asking them to analyze and collect the data. Um, they see the value of that. You know, before it was kind of how many days of classroom instruction that they missed to prepare for this and use you know, the days that are missed for testing them. Um, but our teachers have really bought into this idea of um, meeting our students, like I said, where they are, and where can we push them to. So that whole idea of formative assessment and, and moving that forward. And same thing, parent buy-in, our parents are more aware now than ever um, about the different requirements that graduation does obtain um, on, our, on our kiddos. That data-driven decision-making model, when I first came here three years ago, there wasn't a ton of I don't want to say emphasis, but there wasn't a ton of uh, research and time being spent with the data and what the numbers show. So we've kind of done a major shift at the high school level of looking at that data. What does it mean? Teachers are accountable. Where are students accountable? Um, and I think that's really helped us in this process, and it's a process we're going to have to continue to look at and work on. The remediation and summer testing, um, I wanted to point this out because this was a pretty big success for us this year as well. Um, we had summer remediation for our students who needed to retake the test. So that was put in place. We had a couple of folks with English, we had math, um, and almost all of our students who did the remediation and then tested again in the summer met the point values that they did. So that was a huge push. Um, and we do the same thing now during the school year when we retest again in December. But that was a, a really big highlight for us that those summer testing um, dates really and the remediation dates really helped. And our strength here is just the continuous improvement. You saw all the red and the green on the slide that was presented. There is continuous improvement here. And as we all know, graduation requirements are gonna shift and change, and who knows what they're gonna look like in the next six months, let alone two years. Um, but I think we're on the right path here as far as looking at state like the diploma seals and things like that. We're on the right path to make sure our students are achieving um, and meeting those graduation requirements. A couple other highlights I just wanted to throw in here was the College Credit Plus idea. Um, we have a ton of students that take um, College Credit Plus classes. Uh, we're very lucky to, if you see the CCP modality up there, the high school teachers, I believe that's the 67 percent um, of our kids decide to take CCP, but they have decided to stay in the building and take CCP. So I think that's a large testament to the teachers, the preparation that they're doing. Um, and really our kids, just, they want to push themselves. And it's nice to see that they want to stay with us rather than, you know, be out of high school on the college campus. We would rather have them, you know, living that high school experience with us. So our CCP enrollment has jumped tremendously. Um, and a couple highlights here from our ACT. If you're aware, the state gives a, a state-funded ACT each spring to our students. Um, and it's a ton of fun, let me tell you. Because <laughs> usually we have a plan and then it snows on that day and the plan that we worked really hard on then you know, kind of morphs into, okay, what are we gonna do? Um, but I was really impressed. We did have one student who scored a 36 on the state funded ACT with us in March. Great kiddo, um, Luke Lundy, I'm not sure if you're aware of who he is, but he's just an awesome kid. Um, and then we had 51 students who scored a 30 or higher, which I think is equally as impressive. That. Uh, we are preparing for um, the state test or the ACT test already in uh, February this year. We have a, a company coming in called Next Level Prep this week on Thursday. They're going to offer an ACT workshop to any of our um, sophomores and juniors that signed up for this. Um, it's at a reduced cost to them. They're, they're basically you know, committed to giving up a day in class to go and sit through a boot camp of ACT. 
So it really, we have over 150 students registered for the October date already, which is awesome because some of those kids will go and go take the ACT on their own and not necessarily wait until we test them in the spring. But we're also offering another one of those in February, about two to three weeks before we actually get that state funded test. So I'm, I'm really hoping to see how that improves our scores across the board with that as well. Areas of improvement, there's always room for improvement. Areas of focus. Um, we want to continue the emphasis on data collection. Um, we see that as new staff comes in, we try and acclimate them to the, the procedures we've already put in place um, and just really continue to work as departments in that data analysis and collection. Uh, differentiation is big. We spent a lot of time, we spent time on the 20th when we were talking with our departments about looking at levels of classes. So a general level biology versus um, uh, scholarship biology versus an honors class versus you know, an AP class. So we're really pushing the idea of differentiation across the board. Again, finding where our students are and then pushing them to the level that we know they can get to. Um, and just this continued growth mindset across the board. So a couple of academic goals. Our teachers have really bought into this professional development for teachers and by teachers. Um, it's always nice when you can hear a colleague you know, present an idea. It's a little different than when we're up in, you know, in front of a meeting kind of barking, well, this is what you should do and this is what works. But it's really nice for them to hear from their colleagues. Um, common assessment and alignment. Um, two years ago, I would say, we did not have common assessments in the high school at all. So teachers have tried really hard to jump that train for the data analysis part. And then obviously, we know that um, students who want to come to school do better in school. So this focus of social emotional goals and the new learning standards. We have a Best of the Beavers program, which takes into account some attendance, um, scores on state tests, um, and students' um, grades in their overall courses. So they get rewards for that. They can have discounts on prom tickets and discounts out at Subway and things like that. So this is a pretty competitive program. A lot of the kids want to apply for it. It's a, it's a lot on our secretary to track, but she's doing a great job. Um, and the development of advisory, this was a huge push. We have a great group of teachers who have kind of um, embraced this idea of advisory. We have three days a week at the high school this year. Um, and it's a time to build connections with the kids. Kids who necessarily didn't feel that they had an adult to listen to them before will feel very differently after this. So again, those kiddos that want to come to school, are there and you know, they, they know that there's somebody there to listen to them, and somebody who's always fighting in the corner for them. All right. Any through the slides. Closing in A. So, what will you remember the most? The progress, right? I got it. 
Um, for achievement, for B, overall, Ferguson Hall met five out of the six indicators. Okay? Algebra 1, we had 189 students that took the test, and we had 68.8% passed. That is a huge targeted area for us this year, and we'll speak about that later. Biology, we had 24 students take the test, and 100% of them passed, which strength. Uh, ELA, 573 students took the test, 88% 88 passed. Geometry, we had 320 students that took the test, and 86.3% passed that. We also met the chronic absenteeism and gifted indicators. Um, that geometry versus algebra speaks back to what Laura, Jason, and Bobby already touched on. Um, and again, we'll speak about that in just a moment, okay? Progress, we got a C. D, overall progress for all kids. A for gifted. That low, lowest 20% that Bobby spoke about, um, we got a D, and then an F for students with disabilities. So you can probably see where some of our targeted areas will be spoken to, okay? Um, gap closing, I tried to cut and paste some colors for you, um, but I'm technolo technologically challenged. So um, you can't read it very well, but as you can see on here, that we got an A as we met all of our targets in all of our areas. Um, we have all of the areas that Bobby was talking about earlier in her presentation. So all, sub, all subgroups met their goal. Um, this area looks to see at all the subgroups, we spoke about that already. Even though students with disabilities rated the F for value added, so less than expected growth, they exceeded their targets for gap closing. So what was expected, they exceeded. Um, students with disability, their goal in ELA was 59.6% and they passed with a 68.5. And then in math, it was 60.5. And again, they passed with 79.6. Okay. So our strengths last year, again, we met five out of six indicators. 88% of the students passed the ELA and that was up from 84.6% the year before. 86% passed geometry, and then performance index was an increase from 101.3 to 102.3. Gap closing was all subgroups met their targets. For weaknesses or our targeted areas to be spoken about is Algebra 1, our at-risk student performance, and EL, ELA 1 progress. progress. So what, what is being done at Ferguson Hall? So in general, we're meeting with departments to analyze data for targeted areas. We're having collaboration time set aside for teachers to observe and model strategies. And we're looking at curriculum versus the weaknesses on the statewide assessments to identify and determine those areas for growth. Our achievement for strength, again, was the ELA and geometry. The targeted area under achievement will be Algebra 1. And then for the progress, Strength was the gifted student progress. Students exceeded the expected growth. And targeted areas, students with disabilities, ELA specifically, and the lowest 20%. So our plan for Algebra 1. First of all, the challenge for us is that two-thirds of our students are accelerated, and they took the Algebra 1 test in eighth grade. So we didn't get to benefit from some of their abilities. Um, we are having department meetings discussing the pacing of right now to every class. Our department members are collaborating, collaborating with each other on unit tests and chapter tests, and they have, com they have the tests have, had, have used previously released air test questions. And then the meeting following each test to analyze those questions and to see how the kids are doing in each class. There's also, Laura spoke to the collaboration that was done um, on our last PE. PD day, so we're collaborating with the high school and next round we're hoping to collaborate with the middle school so that we have that vertical alignment um, and the collaboration across the board so that we are seeing how kids are growing um, and working on the weaknesses and supporting the successes already. Next one was the lowest 20% in the students with disabilities. The challenge is, is that their achievement is not where we want it to be. Uh, the least amount of growth was in ELA. We noticed that it was specifically in the area of writing. So we have already got the special ed teacher, the special ed supervisor, and myself. We're working to analyze what data we do have access to and then create a plan. We also have the English department 
regular English department working with a special ed um, English teacher to help her accommodate to the best success. Um, teachers will work to analyze specific test data and look for areas of focus, as I spoke to before. Uh, last year, we actually, our building goal was to uh, work on writing across curriculum, and we are going to maintain that goal this year in addition to others. So teachers reported some improvements, but as you can see, we still have great improvements to make, and we're committed to those. Um, our English teachers are collaborating again with middle school and high school teachers to work on that vertical alignment. They're looking at pacing, they're looking at curriculum mapping and common vocabulary. Um, and that's why I spoke back to the ELA department will then shift and collaborate and support with special ed so that they are getting the same <coughs> curriculum or access as the regular ed population. And then collaboration with special ed supervisor to evaluate the data and instructional strategies to help support that growth. Okay. And we are highly tied to the high school. So when I said Laura did a great job, she said about half of the things I needed to say too. So, you know, we work on the cross-curricular writing, we work on the cross-campus uh, work, the vertical alignment, the horizontal alignment, and when she speaks to the data-driven decision-making, we try and work together so that the teachers across campus are uh, meeting expectations at the same level. Um, sometimes things work better in one building or another, and we even compare amongst administrators, you know, what are you doing that's working better for you with a certain department or with a certain population that it maybe isn't working across campus. So that's been a nice uh, connection for us, too, to help move um, the entirety of the high school levels in the same direction, even though we're two separate buildings. So we're making it work. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Math 8, we have a 
about a 12% gap to close. So I turned that into how many actual students and seats is that? That's about 39 students. So across the sections, you're really looking at four or five students in each class. So if you break it down like that, it's not a giant task, but it feels like you see that 12%. Um, I had mentioned geometry and algebra. All 150 students that took the test met the indicator. So that, that was really awesome. You can see how we outpaced the rest of the state in that category. Um, some other successes, ELA 7, very consistent and steady at 83%. Math 7 was at 76.6%, so there's just a small gap there to close. But actually, the number of students, it's actually 63 students. So it's a smaller percentage, but there's more children. About the same ratio, about six or seven students in each class. Sort of the same phenomenon there as students are accelerated. And some of those students are sixth graders that are taking that, that are part of that computation. Um, strengths overall, we are, if you look at all tests on the far right, we are either meeting or exceeding expected growth or at least meeting it across all tests. So that is something as a building, we combine everything we do, we are doing all right. Um, Areas for growth, uh, Carol Brown and I'm sure Becky Osterfeld and Coy worked on this together. They did some very detailed data analysis. They, like, now that I think about it, I should have cut and pasted what they did up there, but they took every strand of the test and they took information of how many students, they have kind of a four point rubric for writing and they, I know how many students go. A one point, they were 10, 11, 12. So it's very detailed. Um, from that at Ankeny, um, in terms of writing is one area we need to work on more evidence and elaboration in the writing examples. Basically be more specific with what you do. Um, the ELA test is two hours and it's two days. So you're talking four hours of testing. Maybe they're not elaborating because they're tired or you know, we're dealing with 11, 12, 13 year olds. Uh, you know, kids that take the ACT, I think that's three hours and they're seven, 18 year old students. Maybe it's a time management issue. How do I, and they write on both days, so how do I manage the reading piece and then <coughs> myself uh, enough time to write? Um, in terms of the reading analysis, uh, typically we were stronger in literary text, but that took a bit of a backseat to informational text as that was included in the text. So Carol thought maybe we need to balance that out a little bit more. Mathematics, um, we have not completed an item analysis for mathematics. But in looking at our process, just how aware of our students are to set up the question, and then we take them all in Chromebooks now. Our format is different now that we have Chromebooks. Um, how aware are they, are they of the tools within the test that they can use? Um, the one thing is time. How do we get the students our day is now 15 minutes shorter? We took that directly out of our flex period. So, uh, flex used to be 40 minutes, and flex is a building-wide study hall where if I needed help in math or science or LA, I could write to my teacher and get that help. Just anecdotally, walking around last year, every math teacher I walked by, there's a line and 10 kids at their desk. So it's that time factor. How do we get that individual support? Um, one of our brainstorms is to use our NJHS students, National Honor Society students. They need service hours. If they have an area of strength, they can provide that. Um, we're also lucky enough we have a retired licensed math teacher that wants to provide free tutoring at the building level. So we're not sure how we're going to use her, but uh, I'm excited about that. Speaking of su student support, just we have a lot going on at the middle school. We're in our fourth year of our PBIS program. Our motto is be kind, work hard, problem solve. You can probably frame about any issue by asking those three questions. Were you doing any of those? Um, Every Wednesday is character and prevention, where students get a lesson um, to help support them in better decision making, healthy choices, how to interact with their peers better. So those things are already established. Uh, new supports for this year, we're lucky enough to have Rachel Trumbull, uh, sort of a third guidance counselor um, in her area. She is running a couple different groups that meet, uh, changing families group or anxiety group. And the list of groups are growing. I think we have six groups right now, about 30 kids total. And we've got two or three more ideas for more groups. Um, and both pointing, we're having uh, trauma-informed care teams being trained right now. And if you're not aware of that is, that is really, uh, at our level, we're looking at as a mindset that every decision we make for a child, we have their background in mind, gather information, 
understand what kind of trauma may be in their past, and we use that in our decision making. And then also new this year, we have the Hope Squad, which is a suicide prevention program, um, and it, it is student driven. We do the heavy lifting if there's a student in crisis, obviously, but their job is to spread hope. Their job is to be the eyes and ears of the building so we can identify when students are struggling. And the last thing, I told you we have a lot of things going on to support students, so they won't accuse us of not supporting students. Um, if you're familiar with ERO, we had a speaker on our PD day um, at the beginning of the year. There's a group called Focus 3, and they travel across the country. It's about building culture, positive culture. Uh, they work with middle schools, high schools, elementary, so high state football. But it is really a simple formula, just as it is there. In life, you have events. You own your reaction, and, and that is going to produce the outcome. And we, for years, have had a lot of conversations around the building to build more resistance, more resilience. I had some resistance. More resilience <laughs> in our students. Um, this is perfect. Um, that is that is something that is a need, so we can proactively build up that resilience. So when they reach what they feel is a roadblock, they know how to work around it. They are not turning to us to take it out of the way. So, all right. thank you. Any questions? Uh, you can see that our honors and scholarship level courses, we have 100% of our students passing in those 
areas. Um, but if you look at our general slash inclusion sections, those are those. If that's an area of focus for us, is how can we grow those students? A closer look at math by standard um, strengths: math six, geometry and statistics; math seven, ratios and proportions; math eight, functions and the number system. Um, math eight, you can see it's the series of bar graphs on the very right hand side. You can see there's not a lot of red there because eighth grade math did such a great job. Growth areas: math six, ratios; math seven, modeling. And we dug in a little more with just sixth grade math since we passed all the other math areas and kind of looked at those courses. And again, our scholarship level math is passing at 100%, which is amazing. Um, we don't have honors math listed up here because our honors sixth grade students actually take the seventh grade tests. So um, again, our general <coughs> curriculum, our students on grade level and inclusion are our focus area to, um, to grow those kids. Gap closing, these are all of our AYP, that's an old term, subgroups. And you can see the red dots, that's where the state wants us to be in each of those subgroups. And you can see by our bars that we're exceeding where the state has set for those expectations. Progress. So overall, we got a B, not too shabby. Um, obviously striving for an A. Given students, we received an A, for, and this is value added, so expected growth over a year. And as Bobby mentioned, a C is what expected growth is. B and A would be above that. So we had expected growth in the students in the lowest 20%, but we had an F for students with disabilities, hence another focus area. You can also see that there's a lot of red and orange there in, the, in sixth grade, as well as if you look in the column for ELA. Digging into that a little bit more, so historically, this is, this is the past five years, you can see in 2014-15, we were in the red all in all areas. Um, we've made great improvements throughout the years, um, but we made some improvements in special students with disabilities, but we have since seen a decline the last two years. Looking at that lowest 20% value added, um, reading and science, we are doing a good job there. And our grade six composite math and reading are all moving in the right direction. We may uh, not be where we want, but those numbers are improving. Growth areas, we still want to improve in that grade six composite math, and we've seen a decline in grade eight reading in all grades composite. All right, this is the big one where we're going to be focusing a lot of our efforts on it at the building level, is our students with disabilities value added. Our strengths were in the, in the science area, but you do you can see there was a little bit of a decline there in our science index. Um, but areas to focus on, we're, we're seeing a decline in this subgroup of students in value added across the board, particularly in grade six reading and math and grade seven reading. Another thing that we've looked at, so these colors are a little bit different. They look like a rainbow, but if you follow the colors as they go diagonally through the chart, we have charted um, how the students have performed in prior grade levels entering into the middle school. So all the way, like um, if you look at the eighth grade ELA it was a 73.3, so you can see what they scored as a group in fourth grade ELA, and those numbers are a an average of proficiency percentage of all three of our feeder schools. Um, strengths, it seems like seventh grade math, no matter what they're coming into us with, they we always show an improvement in seventh grade math. And then eighth grade math, again, that 19% increase. Growth areas, we do notice a slight decline in all cohorts as they enter and um, progress through middle school. So that's something that we want to address. <coughs> as Dion mentioned, we were lucky enough to have Focus 3 here for our opening day with staff. Um, event plus response equals outcome. We're only in control of our response to events. Obviously, the report card presents some challenges that we need to respond to. Um, Koi Pride is our PDIS, uh, five tenants of PDIS, and so we are looking to respond to way in ways that um, inspire, empower, and lead with Koi Pride. I say that in announcements every single day. So our plan. Our response, data-driven instruction in all content areas. 
As Bobby and Jason mentioned, we had uh, we started that with our professional development day on September 20th, um, and it's going to continue on October 14th. This really sparked a lot of wonderful conversation in our building regarding instruction. Um, also in prep for teachers with OTES 2.0, we're looking at formative and summative assessments. Um, we're also needing to support our special ed department. Right now, the specific like value-added data of specific students, how they perform, specific teachers, how they perform, that's not available yet. But when it does become available, we're going to drill down even more to find out where our strengths and weaknesses and highlight those strengths so we can replicate them. Um, again, determine building specific value-added data, not just the students with special needs. Um, looking at instructional models, different settings, which ones are, are more successful than others, and then um, looking at district successes across the district, and then also in similar districts. Supporting sixth grade math is going to is a focus for us too, uh, particularly in our general educator or general courses. Um, we did plan this year for lower class sizes in those sections, and um, we're focusing on strategies for instruction and assessment. We have some professional development for our sixth grade math. We have had some turnover with staff in that area. Um, and then supporting our ELA department. Last year they had a lot of new initiatives, and so sometimes with new initiatives you do see an implementation dip, but we want to support them in all those areas, particularly in that general level ELA. Um, we've also implemented writing across the curriculum. Speaking a common language, we had, um, they presented at our last staff meeting, a new writing format called RACES, and it's just kind of a pneumatic device to help students remember what they need on a proper constructive response, and we have teachers across the building using that. And we actually, the collaboration between high school and middle school, um, some of the high school teachers have reached out to our middle school department chair asking about this, and I think we're going to start implementing that in the high school. We also are focusing on empowering our teacher leaders. Um, providing support and direction for our department chairs because we can't do this alone. It's a group effort. And so I've been really impressed with all of our department chairs, how they've embraced working with the data and supporting their departments. Also as part of our response is that whole child approach. Many of the same initiatives Dale was talking about. Um, we're starting Hope Squad. Our meeting is tomorrow, our parent meeting. We have a group being trained on trauma-informed care. Uh, we have lots of Tier 2 interventions and Tier 3 interventions that are building this year for SEL needs. Um, we're really happy to have Rachel Trumbull with us um, to provide group work. We also implemented two different types of um, trauma classrooms that students can visit throughout the day if they have that need. We kind of renovated our web program, and then there's our Koi Pride Matrix. So lots going on to address our target areas and I, I know that with our staff working as hard as they are together we'll see great improvements. Any questions? All right. Did you find me? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'll tell you a little bit about Fairbrook and where we're at right now. We're around 560 students. Um, last year was about that same number. We have 89 students who are going, who were on a reading improvement plan last year with 100% of those students that were required to take and pass the third grade and reading guarantee doing that by the end of school year. So that was exciting for us. 76 percent um, or 76 students are um, on an IEP. Six students who speak, spoke English as a second language in grades three through five last year. Um, 167 students who are identified as gifted, um, that's building wide, and 17% of our students who receive free and reduced lunch. 19 students um, were on a 504 plan last year, that was building wide as well. Um, we have a similar number to that for this school year. Um, throughout the 2018-19 school year, we had 38 enrollments with 56 students leaving our school, um, 22 of those at the end of the school year. So I think we're right on average with everyone else. Um, our goals for the year, of course, we start off our school year with the 30, 60, 90 day goals. And, um, but our overriding mission statement is that Fairbrook is a safe and supportive environment where students are motivated to positively impact the world. And we look at that across a lot of different areas.
It's not just academically. Um, this year, our staff is focusing on having a growth mindset along with our students, and we've had a big push with that this year. And the students, it's really fun to hear them say, I don't know how to do that. I don't hear everybody go, yet. <laughs> so that's been a, it's been fun to hear that in the classroom. Um, we do have PACs with PACs partners that we're using each day in all of our classrooms. Trauma-informed care, I know we've talked about that in all the different levels. We're having great support there um, with registered behavior and technicians in the, in the building as well as our prevention team. We are focusing on identifying students who are not making adequate <coughs> progress, and that's not just at the lower levels, but at all levels. If they are making adequate progress, we need to determine what intervention do we need to do with all of those students. Overall, um, for Fairbrook, we received a, a letter grade of B, but our achievement, we had a C with progress of B and a gap closing at an A. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. We um, met six of our 10 indicators. Um, as you can see there, fifth grade, third grade, we had a little bit of trouble there with mathematics. We had 78.7% of our students who um, achieved the proficiency standard there. Um, but if you drop down to fifth grade, obviously that's an area that I need to focus on heavily with our staff. Um, we did focus on that last year as well, and we're continuing to work on, on improving that. If we were to add in for mathematics in fifth grade, if we were to add in our students who took the sixth grade math test um, and look at that, they, those students scored advanced and advanced plus. Um, we had 100% of our students in math six passing, of course, that test and achieving proficiency in math six. If I were to look at that, we would be um, over the 80% mark um, for our students in that area. But um, science, I can talk a little bit about that. Science, we had a brand new teacher teaching science last year. She did a fabulous job. Um, this year, we have a person who um, came from the middle school who is teaching science for us, and that's going to focus for him. So I'm excited to see what he's able to do with that as well. And um, we had. Uh, one of the things that we've had to do in the past because of only having three teachers in fourth grade and three teachers in fifth grade, our teachers have had to split what they teach, whether it be ELA and social studies, science and math, that type of thing. This year we have four teachers at each of those grade levels. So we are able to dedicate a dedicated science person for fourth and fifth grade. And hoping that makes a huge difference for us. As you can see, we are still performing above the state averages in third grade, and I think you'll find that in fourth and fifth as well. So we're excited that we're continuing to perform at a proficient level that is above that of the um, in some areas of the district as well as the state. We have um, in ELA, we are growing that top portion there. If you see in the black, the advanced. We would love to see more in the advanced plus range for both mathematics and English language arts for third grades, so we're working on those things. And that's what I'm talking with. Um, I've just been working with Beth Sizemore a little bit, talking with Ruth a little bit about this as well, so that we need to grow those, those upper tiers and stretch with rigor of those areas. If you notice here, we have our strengths and weaknesses for reading and writing. Um, one of the interesting features that I'm really excited about, I hope others are able to share the same excitement, but one of the areas that our teachers kept talking about was they really needed assistance with writing. That was an area that had been an area weakness for so many years. Last year we started using seconds writing and we noticed a huge improvement in that area. So that was exciting. You can see that's actually now a strength for us. We, um, 35 and 51 um, percent of our students performing um, near proficient and above proficient in those areas. And typically we had seen a decline in that area. So that was exciting. One of the things that I'm going to be focusing on working with our staff on is uh, recognizing relative strengths and weaknesses. And as we know, when we analyze any test scores, you're going to have relative strengths and relative weaknesses. And each of those may change a little bit. So identifying um, based on the test strand where those areas are. So I didn't put it in for each grade level and for each area that is tested in this um, just for time's sake. But we will be working at identifying those strands that are relative strengths and weaknesses and looking at how do we provide more instruction in those weak areas versus where we put our emphasis in last year to see if we can kind of even those out. Strengths and weaknesses for math in third grade, you can see that um, fractions is obviously an area that we need to improve on. This is, we know this is where we really get start getting into um, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing with fractions, and that's sometimes very confusing for our kids at this level. So we'll be working on improving that area. Um, 
with modeling and reasoning, and I think that's a direct, direct attribute to using math and focus, which focuses on that concrete and movement then to abstract as you teach with, with in that area. So modeling and reasoning is definitely an area of strength for us. Again, this is looking at our fourth grade, comparing the English language arts, which would be on your uh, left, and mathematics on the right, and looking at um, we are still performing significantly above the state averages with that. And fourth grade growing that advanced plus and uh, the advanced, so that's exciting for us. Um, once again, writing there. So we're happy, really happy with that. Mathematics pretty even across the board there. So what that told me when I looked at this was that our teacher um, in fourth grade math was doing a really good job of evenly distributing her instruction and um, it, it showed on this assessment. So there. And in fifth grade, um, ELA is on the far left, science in the middle, and mathematics on the right if you're having any trouble seeing that. Once again, the learning of state averages there. And we see um, in mathematics the growing of the advanced plus. Again, these are fifth graders taking that fifth grade math test. Um, show you just a little bit about that. I'm going to just skip through these because I wanted to focus on really our plan. I'll go back here a second. This is mathematics looking at um, math six. And um, Mr. Miller, if you're familiar with him, is the person who teaches of getting stretched out of his students. And you will frequently hear him talking about the rigor of what he's, of what he's teaching and the importance of stretch like that. That doesn't change in the sixth grade math, of course. So we had 100% of our students pass the sixth grade math. And did advanced is in the black, and advanced plus is in the green. So well above. Um, as, the others, uh, as the other administrators have shown you, we are um, concurrently performing and the um, gap closing there, definitely above what was predicted. So I'm excited by that. And that's all of our subgroup areas, um, looking at economically disadvantaged in the green, and uh, students with disabilities in the light blue, down if you look at the bottom two bars, all students in purple and uh, white and Hispanic in the green. Our plan of action, and this is the part where I think is the most important, is looking at what are we doing? How are we going to improve? What are the things that we need to focus and concentrate on? All of our grade level teams meet collaboratively once a quarter for a half a day of planning that focuses on just general planning for looking at the standards they need to cover, how do they want to change, looking at our data, diving into that map data that we receive, and looking at what they need to focus on, on the, with all of our students. They oftentimes look at a report that has quadrants, um, looking at where our students are performing, the students that perform in the top 20 versus students who perform the lower 20 and developing interventions for those students. Um, so we're happy that we get to have spend time doing that. The second part of their day is focusing on students with disabilities and inclusion planning and how do we help those students meet proficiency standards with that. We're going to continue to utilize consultation services with our gifted instructors to stretch our high kids. We want to make sure that we continue to see the rigor there. Um, staff changes revolted, resulted in different science teacher this year. I'm excited to see how that changes things. Um, I think he has the historical perspective of looking at things from a middle school perspective. And I'm um, excited to see how that rigor that he might bring to our um, fifth grade will enhance our instruction there, as well as our fourth grade teacher being dedicated to science instruction. Watching that over time to see how that changes our, um, how our students perform. We are continuing to use level literacy intervention text with our third grade students. Um, and one of the big exciting things that we have this year, St. Andrew's Church, which is right next door to us, really has asked to partner with us. That is their mission for this year's uh, partnership. And so many people in their congregation have offered to come in and provide daily tutoring <coughs> services to work with our kids. So we're able to break our students down into even smaller groups and target different student um, groups with them. So they're going to be providing assistance with us with reading fluency, reading comprehension, math fluency, um, and looking at um, helping us with the <coughs> use of eSpark and watching how our students are using that, making sure that our students are getting feedback with that as well. Um, we have reading groups five times a week that meet with our students um, for our lowest 20% using the math assessment when we look at those students and their performance. 
Um, the teachers are targeting those students five times per week. In the past, they tried to do three to four. We're changing that to five times per week, so that's exciting. And I'm focusing then on the um, comprehension, comparison, and contrast seems to be across the board an area that our students are having some difficulty with when it comes to reading comprehension. So focusing on those areas, strengthening that, and um, writing for an area for our students on the piece. I thought I would show a picture of um, one of our students jumping a hurdle at the Fairbrook Foxtrot last Friday. Um, because we know we have hurdles that we need to overcome when we're working with it. Are not those? Any questions? Okay. Students and our staff. 
areas that need to grow is everybody else. So our fifth grade math, the goal was 80. And like I said, we didn't meet it was 78.5. And I'll get into specifically what areas we need to grow there. And our gifted indicator, um, last year we had an F. Um, this year we had a D. Um, so we're moving in the right direction. We're just not there yet. Um, K through three, the improving at-risk readers. Um, again, no rating. Our progress or value added. Overall, we had a B. Our gifted students, again, they get us in two categories, so we really need to continue pushing those students. Um, low is 20% a B, and then students with disabilities, we had an A. Um, and as you can see, 102 students um, moving them. That was pretty uh, positive. Gifted, but like I said, the value added is where we really need to um, focus on making more growth than just the um, average. And then we met the other two indicators there. Gap closing met all of our targets, so it was uh, it was nice to see all that this year. So our plan. Um, as you can see, we said that our fifth grade was an area of um, growth for us. We already sat down with our teachers, um, horizontal alignment, we looked at the data. We're gonna get together again on the 14th and dive even deeper, trying to figure out over the past couple years, where is it that we're continuing not to meet those targets. Fractions, the modeling, the reasoning that Joel talked about, we're struggling with those in our fifth grade. So those are areas we need to figure out. Um, we, last year we went through and, and looked at what questions we were doing well in. And then we also looked at the tests, the questions, and they looked at how they were teaching those questions and where they were missing them. And they were revamping some of those things in the classroom. So we need to look at those again. Um, the gifted indicator, like I said, the value added. Um, so when it comes out later on this month, hopefully we're, I think it comes out this month, uh, we're gonna look at the fifth quintile and we're gonna look at what areas we need to push those students. And we've already, already had a conversation with a gifted teacher about, hey, how can I help support those kids and those staff members? And so she's gonna definitely be part of those conversations with us. Happy to have Ms. Levisor on our team. Um, any questions? There are some extra slides for your viewing pleasure later on. <laughs> <laughs>
team, as well as a registered behavioral technicians and prevention teams throughout the building for that social emotional support that our kids need. This is our report card from last year. So overall, Parkwood did receive a B, and that has gone up from C from the previous year. We, on our achievement, which is, uh, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into the achievement, um, which we overall got a C. Our progress, we got a C. Our gap closing, which has all the subgroups, we ended up with an A. And then we're really proud of the improving at-risk K-3 um, readers, because that was our focus last year. We've always received a grade in that. Um, indicator and so last year our focus was to get 5% of our kindergartners not on ramps and, and so we ended up getting in, uh, not rated because of that so that that really helped our report card um, this is basically these are our indicators that uh, for third fourth and fifth grade as well as sixth grade sixth grade does um, count for our buildings and so third grade we um, is 80% is to meet the indicator so if you see in mathematics we we missed that indicator by 0.8 of a percent, which is one student. Um, so we're gonna really look into that area as well. And then um, if you see also in the science, we had 79% of our students pass that science test. And so we missed that indicator by 1%. So um, we've grown in, in all of our, our percentages for, for all of the subject areas. But we, you know, we, when you miss an indicator by one student, it kind of, <laughs> Make sure you reflect on some things that, that you do and get throughout the year. Um, we did meet the chronic absenteeism as, as well as the gifted indicators, so we did get four out of the ten indicators. And this is Parkwood's uh, third grade compared to the district as well as the state. Now on the left hand side, you'll see the mathematics, and on the right hand side is the ELA, English Language Arts. In third grade, also, this is the um, this is the performance index piece that we really want to focus on because each each level is a percentage, and that's how you get your your performance index. You can get up to 120 points on your performance index, and Parkwood got 100.3. So each one of those categories, you get a, a specific um, it's an equation that the state comes up with, and basically that multiplies the kids that perform in those different levels, and so really want the top end of it to be the, the, the largest um, and on here the advanced in mathematics is the biggest part of that bar, bar graph and um, so we're really focusing on enriching a lot of the students we also focus on the intervention as well and on grade level but sometimes the enrichment piece also we need to really look at the kids that really need to, to be enriched this is third grade English language arts as well as mathematics and if you see the um, in third grade we were able to get on uh, the website it's the tide portal which is where the all of our testing information is from and they break it, a lot of this down for us and so it's really user friendly for the teachers to go in and, and look at some item analysis and see where their strengths and weaknesses are so our ELA for third grade um, we did have a strength in the reading literary text, so the test is broken down by three standards. So you have the reading informational text, um, reading literary text, as well as writing. And our strength was in the literary text. And writing wasn't too far off, as well as the informational text, but um, we are going to concentrate on the writing piece, uh, as well in third grade. In mathematics, again, it's broken down by the different areas. The, the blue is the proficient. Uh, the above proficient and then the, the purple is where it is uh, almost too proficient. So our strength in math in third grade uh, is the numbers and operations and we need to work on fractions. So that just is kind of an overview of, of the, the areas that we really need to work on. And then you can also go into an item analysis where it really breaks down uh, the percentage of kids that pass individual questions. And then this is where we're gonna work with our teachers on. Um, we did a little bit of this at the professional development on September 20th, but we really need to dive in when we have the grade level uh, meetings with our, with our teachers on what areas are our strengths and what areas do we need improvement. <coughs> and if you really look at the vertical alignment of this, a lot of the strengths that are in third grade also go up, up into the fifth grade. So like time and money, for example, is something that we don't spend a lot of time on, 
at the beginning of the year up to the test time. So that was one of our weaknesses or areas of improvement. So we need to really look into the curriculum and see you know, when that is being taught and uh, making sure our kids uh, know how to do those type of things before the assessment. And again, <coughs> focus on strengths and areas of improvement in third grade for math as well. And we, you can get all of this information on, um, on the TIDE uh, website. And so just to have building that capacity for our teachers to understand how to use this data and drive instruction is uh, one of our goals this year. And then we have our fourth grade. Again, um, we have mathematics on the left and English uh, language arts on the right. Our fourth grade is phenomenal in mathematics. They, they scored really, really well this year. And, um, and we're very proud of our fourth grade mathematics, as well as um, our sixth grade mathematics at 100% as well. So we kind of look at the uh, district as well as the state. We're always about the state, and you know we're teetering on the district level, so we're, we're trying to, to even that piece out as well. Again, the performance index and, and showing how many kids scored the advanced plus, advanced, accelerated, proficient. And um, this also has a lot to do with the value add piece. So the more kids that you move from one area to the next, that, that also gives points for the value add in the performance index. Again, it's broken down, again, by the, uh, the skills. So English language arts, reading informational text, literary text, as well as writing. And we did focus on writing last year as a building. And so our fourth and fifth grade writing um, did increase, so we're, that was one of our strengths. And then we're looking at the literary text and informational text as well for areas of improvement. Our mathematics, um, we have the geometry as being a strength, as well as modeling and reasoning and fractions. They're all pretty much close, but the multiplication and division is an area that we're going to look at as well. And then again, the strengths and the areas of improvement, um, breaking them down by the actual skills that go underneath those uh, the standards. Here's our fifth grade data, and this also includes Parkwood and the district and the state. And again, our, um, our areas where our kids did perform, and we're really wanting to make sure that we get more advanced plus and advanced, and make, bringing up those limited students to basic even is, is a huge um, value for our kids. In our fifth grade English language arts and mathematics and it shows the that writing was a significant strength in fifth grade we were up to 77 percent of our students that were above proficient on the writing piece and then we are going to look at the informational text in, in our fifth grade language arts as well as mathematics we have um, we have a strength in the decimals and it's pretty much you know all pretty much all the same but then we also have the fractions and again, the strengths and the areas of improvement that um, really dives down on the actual skills that the kids need that we're going to go over as a building. And the math strengths and the areas of improvement as well. Here's our sixth grade. 100% of our students did pass the, the sixth grade um, math assessment, and that was included as an indicator on our report card. Um, and for the, for the most part, I believe there was only one student that did not get the advanced plus. So uh, there was one student that had advanced, and, and that's very that's phenomenal for the for the kids. This is the trend over five years. So back in 2015, that was my first year in Beaver Creek, and um, if you see that the growth with the top, that's where you want a lot of the growth. But you also want to make sure that you're growing the intervention. But we're really, we've really focused on stretching our kids and making sure that they're being enriched throughout um, the last five years. And that's our fifth grade math. But pretty much, it's um, everything's a strength there because all of them pass the, the assessment. But we might want to look at maybe ratios and proportions. This is the gap closing piece by subgroup, and the red dot is what the state is um, is wanting. The, the schools to achieve, and so we surpassed that. We did get an A in our gap closing, and this is for English language arts, and then this is for our math. 
And again, we surpass that um, as well for all of our subgroups. So we have all students, we have white, and we have economically disadvantaged, and we also have students with disabilities. So most of um, the elementary have those four subgroups. Again, our goals for this year, we're going to have grade level collaboration time and make sure that we're really diving into the data and looking at the skills that need to be, um, to be supported and enriched looking at the curriculum and making sure that, that there is enough time to, to build that into the curriculum and everyone is able to do that instructionally um, before the test. And then we are we do team leaders, which is a which is um, a building level team that really looks at, at what the, the initiatives for the building are. And so we're going to bring them in to make sure that even our K2 kids and, and teachers know what's going on in the 3-5, third through fifth grade. And then we're going to do content area professional development um, for teachers who need it, whether it be in the district or outside of the district. And then we just want to make sure that we're looking at data-driven driven instructional decisions. Do you have any questions? Interestingly enough, 
our strength is analyzing informational text. Now, just two years ago, it was literary, literary text. So they have really hit the informational text hard, and now a weakness would be to go back to that literary text. Even though we started a new writing initiative last year, they still, um, our teachers still want to gain more points. Kids are getting one, two points, they want to get three, four points for the writing. So they've come up with their goals in these areas. Uh, math, our strength in third grade was multiplication, division, and then fractions was the area to improve. I don't know about you, but fractions are tough for everybody, <laughs> especially third grade. So fourth grade data, our math is definitely higher here. Um, really proud of that fourth grade math. They've done wonderful things with co-teaching. As you can see, our, even stretching our higher end kids, um, because we love that math. Fourth grade here, theirs is analyzing literary texts. That was their strength. Again, they want to work on writing, and it's more of supporting their point of view um, with information from the text, which is difficult, as you know, for fourth Our math strengths here were multiplication division. That was surprising me, because I always hear from my teachers, they don't know how to multiply, but they do. So when they sat down to say they said, oh, they do know how to multiply, but we need to work on geometry. Fifth grade that also has the science in there. Fifth grade, we've kind of talked about that. That's 61.5 percent to about our higher learners, and the teachers were talking about that. If you see our the top end in math, obviously isn't the greatest because they're taking their sixth grade. They're worried about having role models in that class too. So we're trying to figure out how we can work that in uh, maybe next year. So we're still kind of looking at that. When fifth grade said, they said comparing, contrasting genres and themes in literary text. That's a challenge. Obviously, it's, it's hard to do. So, and then to follow that up, adding evidence to support their explanatory writing. Our strengths in math uh, decimals and place value, and then we're still working to the fractions. And get, I think they get a, fractions get a bad rap. And they follow that a little bit there. Uh, our sixth grade, we got 100 percent. So we're proud of that. That class did great. Again, I think we only had one student also who didn't um, score the advanced. So these, this is our subgroups. I think we have them all. <laughs> so, so we're, uh, that's why I said that maybe we changed to Shaw International. Um, the one area we didn't meet um, projected growth was the ELA for our students with disabilities. So that is something we are working on. Like I was telling you, with the math, we did well in that, but with ELA, we are going to start with more of teaching going to have and working in guided reading groups and the upper grade levels. But as you can see, all the rest of our students beyond what the state expected them to be. Um, this is our English language learners. They were expected to get 54% and they scored 80. So, they did really well. so our overall plan as um, a school is to be all looking at analyzing data for map data. And this year we've added on end of unit assessments because they were often different pacing. So now we're all in the same pacing identify those areas to reteach and improve. Quarterly, we meet as grade levels to analyze student writing. This is new this year. We're comparing rubrics and student writing to identify areas of growth and improvement. Definitely diving into the student writing is that really far into the student writing, so we can see where we should improve. We have started this year with mentor programming. We have a ton of students with um, trauma. So we are working, we have a lot of struggling students. We've matched them up with mentors. That is every adult in the building. And everyone has a, a, a kiddo to check in with, I have three, but some people have more than one and we just make a bond. And that is specifically to build their confidence in school and want to be in the school and in their reading skills. An added bonus that they have a friend on their side, but um, we're reading with them. We even have some of our fifth graders that are our student council. They're doing that as well on our, just the kids that are quiet and shy and they're trying to bring them out a little bit. And then continue our PBIS to build self-regulation skills in all students and that's Questions? Sorry, that was quick. We have to find something. Perfect. Want to find something? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.
I do want to kind of share the how Trayvine got rolling along because we had a unique experience. We got to start a brand new school and we had staff come from all five elementaries and we got to kind of figure out what do we want the school to be? What do we believe in? What do we want to make it look like, feel like, those kind of things. So our motto from the get-go was let's make it great and what can we do to make it a great place? So we are um, working on that still and so far we're really proud of what we've been able to do. We do have some unique enrollment issues and you, know, you see all the kids in the picture, but we started in 2013 and our building built for 700 kids with 572 and it was great. We had empty rooms and we were spread out and it was wonderful. And things quickly grew from there and now we are at 830 students. Um, that was the first day of school, I think we're at 826 now. But um, it's a lot of new kids. So with that enrollment comes, um, we have 33 homerooms lot for an elementary school. Three of our homerooms are located inside Coy Middle School and it takes staff members from the middle schools and two other elementaries to serve our students in their special area classes. So we do have some kind of uh, unique things going on. With our enrollment we have over 200 military students, uh, kids whose parents are in the military. Um, and it adds kind of a different dimension because it bring, they bring a lot of richness, they bring a lot of life experiences, and they've seen different things, and they've seen different parts of the country, and so that's kind of cool. It, it really adds something. They also come and go. You know, they're with us for two or three years, and then they leave, but um, we really enjoy our military kids, but sometimes, you know, it's hard to see them go, and sometimes it's hard to catch them up when they very first get here. So our school overview, uh, Trayvine did very well. We're really proud of our kids and our staff members. So we did get all A's this year, and that was very exciting to see. And I've been looking on the ODE website to find other schools in Ohio because I have found one that has all A's as well. So um, a lot of people have an A in achievement, but they have no, they don't get the other ratings. So I would imagine they're considered all A's too. So there are a couple of so it was exciting, for sure. Okay, and here are our test results with all, the uh, with all the different grade levels. And we did meet all indicators this year again. So overall, I would say we've done well. I, if you look at third grade, ELA, 84% is not as high as like some of the other grade levels. But we did have like 28 kids in a class last year in third grade. And that is another thing we're facing this year. I have large class sizes. I have a fifth grade class with 31. I have 29 in fourth grade, 20 in second grade. Um, they are large class sizes. So that is a challenge that we try to work around because the teachers do a great job of really trying to put the kids in small groups, ability groups, even in fourth grade. My fourth grade math teachers will do pre and post testing and they'll put the kids into small groups based on their needs for that information they're teaching at that time and really try to meet their needs where they are. And I think that's why our math scores are going where they are. But even in fourth grade ELA, you'll see a lot of small groups, which we see all the time in our primary grades, kindergarten first, you're gonna see a lot of small reading groups, but we're seeing it in fourth and fifth grade and it's paying off, so that's exciting. Um, fifth grade science does very well. Um, I will state too that my one of my science teachers is uh, she took the STEM fellowship training, and I think that really helped her. Beth had her go to that or helped us get her into that program, and I think it made a huge difference. She's a lot of hands-on activities, and so since she kind of was the leader of the other science teacher, by default they also did a lot of hands-on, and that really got the kids engaged. Um, third grade comparisons and. You know, our scores are on the left. And the reason I put, you'll see a picture on every one of my comparison pages because for me, personally, it's important to know that we're talking about people. So we're talking about teachers, we're talking about kids. And I know we've looked at insane amount of numbers tonight. And I think it's important for all of us to remember that those are people. And everyone's different, and everyone has different needs at different times. And so, I just, it, it helps me and I hope it helps you to remember that these are real people. Um, and people that are amazing at their job, I would say, right there's probably one of the best. So third grade, um, fourth grade, again, they did very well. 
like I said, fourth grade math, you look at 93.7, they do work very hard to pre and post test standards and make sure they cover everything. But they do a lot of small group work. And, and if you go in those classrooms, and, and anyone in here is welcome to come visit any time, you will see kids, they're doing different things at different times, they're supporting each other, they're engaged, they're using their Chromebooks for some things and not for other things. So it's a variety of things happening, and I think that helps the kids stay excited about that. Fifth grade is another awesome teacher and some of her kiddos. Um, fifth grade did very well again this year. Um, like everyone else, our math could have been higher, but our highest, brightest fifth grade students are taking sixth grade math. So uh, that leads to the next slide, and we did have 100% passage there as well. Two little cuties. <laughs> Um, Jason said this was a chance to celebrate our success, so I made a slide just for that. <laughs> some, some little kiddos on there. And um, Mr. Atten, my teachers took your advice, and there are free hugs, signs all around Trayvine, Correct. and uh, a lot of hugging going on. So it's been great. It's been um, awesome. So I wanted to just to talk about a couple of our successes. Um, academically, we're doing a good job, and I think there are a lot of things that are making that happen. It's kind of a perfect storm because we have families who are very, very engaged. They're highly involved with their kids. They're highly involved with their child's school. We have very good teachers who have been trained, um, not only by the district, but they've come to us from top universities. And these are the people, the highest quality teachers, are the ones that want to come to Beaver Creek. We, we get to hire the best, and, and that helps a lot, too. I would say also the community support makes a big difference. Um, and I think the fact that the teachers have very high expectations for themselves and for each other. And they'll support each other to get where they need to go. That's what I see happening. Is they're not going to just let that teacher not do well if it's next door to them. They work together. And like the other teams, the other schools have stated, we have these grade level meetings where they really, really look at the standards and support each other and plan together. And I think that makes a huge difference as well. So it's a great environment. Um, Imagine wouldn't want to be any other place. So, our goals for this year um, is to continue to plan as grade levels to pre test and post test standards. Um, one thing we have really talked about is supporting our primary grades because what we're finding is if a student gets to third grade and they don't really have those true basic, basic fundamental skills in reading and math, you can't teach them how to think more critically about what they're reading they're still struggling with decoding or those kind of things, we have got to get those basic skills mastered. Um, eSpark, some of those programs help with that, but the teachers really are working in small groups to hit those skills and get those mastered. Um, we do, the teachers utilize their own map data. They look back on it for each child because just thinking about what I did last year or what maybe you know I got a good score on or whatever, those kids are gone. What do your kids today need? So they look at that information. And one thing that we've been really proud of is um, we've been building leadership opportunities for our kids. We have our Wolf Pack now, which is kind of like a student council, student leadership group, and um, working on social emotional skills for all kids, just as all the elementaries are. So we're busy and we're proud of that and we're having a great time. So does anyone have questions?
151 students. Uh, we're pretty even uh, throughout the year in the Valley. Um, 38 moments, 31 withdrawals. So 18 of those. Uh, just as the other elementaries, you know, point of emphasis at Valley, and I think this is probably uh, our biggest success, um, and I've just seen a huge culture change um, just the last couple of years with the Valley teachers, just the empathy and the understanding of what kids uh, are going through, and we focused on um, what, you know, making the teachers aware of what is going on in the students' brains, um, you know, so that they, they understand what the kids are going through that they can put things in place for them. Um, so I think I have a lot of teachers that have really taken that to heart and they are doing things amazing. Um, and Su even Susan, I was going to mention like the RBTs, the, the registered behavior technicians. You know, today, you know, we had one that her students that she normally worked with were in the building. So she went into another classroom, observed a student we've been having a lot of trouble with and immediately was able to help that teacher um, tweak her behavior plan that she was going to start Monday um, and say, no, no, to be successful, we need to do this. We need to change it to this goal. We need to award it differently. Um, this is how often she should, should be successful. Um, so that, that trained person um, immediately impacted just walking in on that first day and, and, and spending less than a day with me. Um, so that was you know, just the amazing supports that the staff members working as a team to do. Like, something that um, was, you know, was our uh, a big, a big uh, success for us last year. Uh, overall, we had a B for Valley, um, down from an A last year, so not gonna lie, we're a little bummed. Um, but uh, achievements, um, we won't go into some of these. Progress, I will say, and kind of goes back to what I was saying about supporting our students. Um, I know some of the other buildings have talked about kind of the, the progress um, components and the students with disabilities and the lowest 20 percent. Um, we actually had A's and B's in those. So I think um, supporting our most struggling kids were um, a definite strength um, for Valley. Um, I did, uh, and I will go into the improving the at-risk K-3 readers because we did have uh, a rating. I think you know, that was the only elementary, you know, we were the only elementary that had one. Um, we had four kindergartners on a rent last year, so that qualified us for a grade. <laughs> so um, we had about 75 um, kindergartners last year, four of them were on rent, so the, we did get a, a rating. Um, I got to put that on here. Like I said, we are a little bummed this year. Um, we thought things were going well as we look back from 2016. You know, uh, we've been building each year and then took a little bit of a step back this last year. Uh, Indicator-wise, um, you know, the ELA third grade definitely is a concern. That was kind of a shock. We've been in the 80s um, the last couple of years, so um, that, was, that was a little bit of a shock for us. Um, math is actually, for third grade, was up from last year. So um, that was our emphasis last year was our third grade math, so we did go up um, about five percentage points there. So that was a positive for us, even though we still didn't quite get there. Um, ELA fourth grade was a little bit surprised too, because we mostly we met in the 80s. Um, so we're looking at what we uh, what we can do to help uh, push those. And we had a lot of kids that just missed the 700 cut scores. We look at it; they grew a lot through the year, um, but they were you know scoring six, you know, just below 700. So you know, really trying to help those kids um, identify them through our math um, testing through the year to help that. Um, Mathematics um, is fifth grade. Um, everybody's kind of struggling with that. Yes, last year we had 80% exactly, so we did fall a little bit this year um, in science. Um, gifted indicator, um, that was a definite positive that we um, also did. Uh, so we've looked at a lot of these um, throughout. And like I said, uh, third grade ELA, definitely a concern. Um, it was a pretty significant drop for us. So we got and looking at just uh, kind of breaking it down by the different subgroups or sub uh, tests, um, it's not super helpful because all the ones I'm going to show you, they're going to be pretty much evenly matched. So we got to dig deeper um, into the item analysis and look at the different strands in, in C uh, where the students were um, struggling. So there weren't a lot of glaring weaknesses. 
weaknesses, and there weren't a lot of um, overwhelming strengths. So that's something that we're definitely looking at. Um, you know, model and reasoning, I think that's, you can see, uh, that's been a consistent theme all night, all night with uh, the math. Uh, fractions, of course, um, is the one in the middle of the email as far as the one that needs some attention. And we're finding, a, you know, we're, I think, struggling with trying to get the kids to have those uh, math facts down. It seems to be something that students uh, and parents are aren't uh, taking us serious and it really, uh, I think, does affect our fractions. Um, ability is just to you know, understand and manipulate them um, without those facts. So we're we're going to try to implement some transition for that. Fourth grade math um, was a, a definite strength. Um, last year we were in the 90s, so I know uh, Solson was a little disappointed with that. But, you can see, I know others have commented also about the just the advanced and the advanced plus. Um, you know, you know that's showing up more and more and growing each year as a, a definite uh, strength. Fourth grade ELA kind of breaking down a little further. Reading informational text was a was a strength. Um, as you can see, writing and literary text. Fifth grade ELA was also a strength, um, and writing it, and we looked at it, and I know some others have talked about it, writing each year, the last two, three years, uh, we definitely have seen an, uh, a definite increase, and um, you know, just with uh, Smeckens only being a couple years old, we're really excited to see how the younger kids that are coming up, and you know, that have started with Smeckens at an earlier age, um, and that writing instruction, how that's going to grow. It's, it's Definitely by the time they've hit fifth grade now, it's a very, you know, very important strength. So. so fifth grade math, very similar to others. I taught a lot of science in the middle school, so when the science grade came back, I was a little like, okay, I can help with this one for sure. So we'll, we'll definitely be diving into that. Uh, sixth grade, same as many others. Uh, Know, definite strength. We did have one student at Valley actually take the seventh grade test, a fifth grader taking the seventh grade test, and he had come and he passed it um, as well. So he had a chance plus in the seventh grade test. So, um, Dr. Sizemore helped out a lot with him because he, uh, he we did not have a teacher that um, was teaching him, so she helped enroll him in some college classes and, in the, and things in the seventh grade online class um, for math. He stayed at Valley because his parents wanted him to stay. They didn't want to move him on to middle school already. Um, we wanted him in Valley and uh, we made it work for him and he had to take a coding class um, in the second half of the year. So it was pretty, pretty neat. Um, the at-risk K3 literacy. This, uh, this was a little bit of a shocker for us too. The year before we had 57% um, that moved from students that were not on track to on track. So. Um, you know, last year actually I did start, um, a, you know, kind of I spent a lot of time um, in K1 with um, uh, Rick Wiley helped, and we were noticed the last couple of years at the end of the year our, our reading uh, students that were getting, you know, their reading levels at the end of the year. We had some concerns about kids not moving on. I think, you know, I think, you know, um, you know, this, you know, Mr. Walk just mentioned if they don't have those strong foundations and. K2, that you know, 3-5 is, is much more difficult. So, um, you know, I had actually started that with Ruth you know, last year as far as she came in and she spent some days um, in the building with K and 1 um, and really seeing what the instruction looks like. Um, there were a lot of new course materials um, adopted and she uh, kind of opened their eyes to, you know, what um, those things and how all the systems could work together. And I, this year, they are just amazed at how easy and seamless they're able to cover all the different areas with, um, with the different materials and how much quicker they can react to what they're seeing their students struggle with. So um, I'm, I'm, they're very excited about it, um, and I'm excited to see how that turns out. Um, performance index, um, you know, same as others. You know, um, you know, it's a great thing to see that 
Uh, we, you know, you love to see those achievement scores, you love to see above the 80%, um, but I think this is where the teachers, and I think we are almost proud, is you know, we grow our kids, and that's, and that's what uh, we want. We want to, wherever they are, we're gonna grow them um, and meet their needs. Uh, the one indicator or the one subgroup that we didn't make was the math for students with disabilities. We missed it by 0.2%, part of a kid that is funny. Um, <laughs> so, um, so the plan for, for this year, um, I think, you know, we feel that, uh, you know, what we've been doing has, has worked really well. This year we're just reevaluating and see what those different strengths were. Uh, we met last month already, or actually it's still this month, it's the 30th, and started looking over that data. Um, you know, I meet with the team, and my goal this year, I met with them four times last year with the grade levels. This year, I'm hoping to meet uh, once a month with each of the grade levels um, for, you know, at least an hour where we are going over those trends and we're going, um, going through those, uh, through the data, through MAP, and trying to identify those kids. Um, like I said, continue implementation of the new K-1 uh, literacy materials. I think they just kind of scratched the surface and they're so excited to, um, you know, just dig deeper into that. Um, so we're very excited about that. And actually with uh, support from, um, from Mr. Enix, uh, I'm coming from the middle school, I was a math and science teacher, so K-1 literacy has is, is, um, been a, a bit of a journey for me to learn and understand, um, but finally going to um, get some, I guess, official training with uh, the Literacy Leadership Academy. Um, it's a six day, course um, over, this, over the next three months. Um, it's uh, sponsored by the Read, uh, Reading Recovery and Literacy Collaborative in the uh, Ohio State. So very excited about that. It's focused for um, administrators in not only understanding the process, but also helping to support and build the, the foundation in the building level. So you know, what, what do teachers need? How should it be organized? What, what does it need to look like? So, so that I can do everything I can to help support that. Because I think this is walked right with, you know, if we're struggling, if they're if they're behind after kindergarten, they're behind after first grade, they're behind after second, then um, it's gonna be an uphill battle for them. So Guesses that's probably more data than you had in <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I hope that what uh, all of you have found tonight is that uh, there are a lot of really great things happening, which we already know, and also that there are obviously areas for growth, which is true in any organization, and, and uh, it's important for us to acknowledge that. I would like to thank all of our building principals for their very hard work to bring this together tonight, to share with all of you. Uh, if you can believe this, this is really just touching the surface. What they were asked to do with you tonight is to share some of the broad spectrum ideas of what happens with the state report card and areas for growth. But in the buildings, what they're doing with their staff, what our staff is doing with their kids to analyze this data, to focus on improvement, um, it is, is a much deeper look into um, the, the business of education. And, um, you know, Certainly, our, our building principals have a very, very difficult job. It is, um, for someone that's not done the job before, uh, it's probably hard to imagine the literal thousand plus decisions that they have to make every single day. Um, and many of them, not about the education of our students. It's everything else. Um, so I applaud their efforts to put this together, to begin analyzing the data, to be on the journey for uh, really working to be instructional leaders in the buildings, and part of our job is to support that work um, with what's happening in the buildings and with our kids every day. So thank you, thanks to all of you for your time and effort to do this this evening. So, um, thank you. so again, just would like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to share this information with you. Um, I can appreciate the work that they've they put in tonight, and it will certainly be the beginnings of a continuous process throughout the year. And, and, and to acknowledge something else that, that is really very important for all of our principals, we, we fully understand that 
this year presents a, a new challenge for, for many of our principals. As we well know, that um, there's been a lot of movement of our staff throughout the district as a result of reductions of last year, and they're welcoming so many new staff members into their buildings, sometimes in different content areas. And so this kind of work to really immerse new staff members into um, their new positions, their new roles, their new content areas and buildings it is really, really critical, and I applaud the leadership and being able to provide that for these new staff members uh, to their buildings. So again, I want to thank you very much for your, for your time tonight, and if you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for all the work you do on your staff every single day. I was just so impressed tonight without the students. All you do is put them first and how you meet their needs and make accommodations for all of them. So I wish I could talk more, but I just need you. I know my husband's thrilled. <laughs> just so I thank you all everything you do every day for our kids. And with that, announcements. I'm going to let you read it. There you go. Board of Education meeting. There you go. Group 17, 2019, 6.30 p.m. Thank you. <laughs> and we're going to go to the board on um, the comments. This is over. Hi. Go for it. Board uh, comments. Board comments. I, I really enjoyed the evening, actually. It did go on a little too long, but that's because we've got so many schools. Not about you. <laughs> Good job. Um, I, I still have a little concern in the area of gifted education, and I would just like to urge those of you that are down in the elementaries, find those kids that are gifted and don't want to be found, because there are so many more that we don't catch if the parents aren't given a little fun or letting us know, you know what some of the problems are. Um, and I mean, when gifted kids get into the, into the middle grades, they, they sometimes bury themselves even further. And I'm, you know, we need to pull them up. I, you know it's personal for me in some ways, but I mean, I've, I've seen so many that didn't get pulled up, and by the time they get to middle school, we divide them into areas where we think, you know, this is show. We have so many gifted kids that figured out in third or fourth grade that how to pass. They just figure out how to pass, and they think that's all they need to do to get a diploma, and they'd be so much better so much better if we had them in a program that was helping. So let's think a little bit about what we do when we get to middle school, because that's where the cut starts. And we're losing them. We're losing them. Um, they bore easily, and um, it's just important. It is important. So nothing against anything anybody said. It's just that I think those gifted numbers could have a whole lot more people in them, and the only way to find it is to go shake them out of their little reverie of I've got my 65.65% uh, one. Thank you. It's your tail. Me next. Got to make my head explode. <laughs> Start with that. Having uh, been a teacher, of course being involved in so many levels of uh, dealing with students. And um, it's a tough job. We always have to remember that kids are always works in progress. And it's not a, a, a linear uh, curve in, the, in development of children. So we all, just like the rest of us, uh, we learn when it is important to us to learn. And teachers, of course, and administrators, and the school system in general, the culture in general, um, plays an important part of that. Because even though the kids may think they're not ready to learn, motivation helps out a lot. And I think that's where classroom teachers come in, all the support staff, and uh, all of those things, all of those things. But just basically, I was sitting, jotting down themes that I heard through all of the, all the presentations that you did. And I think um, 
it just seems like the common themes to me were that uh, that you guys are caring people and you wouldn't be in this job if you that you didn't see a uh, hope for the future in every child that walks uh, through the door and again noticing that they're all works on pro in progress uh, focused effort is that all of this data-driven analysis that you uh, put together it provides a menu or a pathway, I guess, uh, for the focused effort to help get you from point A to point B. Um, that you have great empathy, I think, as well, and in terms of understanding kids, some of the discipline programs you have, taking kids uh, where they're at, um, considering their backgrounds, trying to filter those things into uh, the building a better human being. Uh, and providing support and goals. I have a whole big list here, but I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> so, but thank you very much. It's uh, an incredible, incredible thing. It's important that um, the teachers know uh, the data. Uh, on a more global sense, it's important that the community knows this data too, because really this testing, uh, for me, it doesn't have a direct link to, in most cases, digging down to an individual student and how I'm going to help Johnny out. Unfortunately, it is very uh, oriented toward how well is Beaver Creek doing, or how well is Valley doing, or how well is, is uh, Trayvine doing. Uh, unfortunately, I, th I think to me that's a, a, a misuse of the data, but that's the way the community looks at it, unfortunately. I'm, I'm going to be poor. Oh, I'm next. Okay. Yes, Rod, how long do I have? Because I feel like talking. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank each and every one of you for all you do every single day for kids. Talk about empathy, talk about doing the right thing. You guys are phenomenal when you do that, so thank you. Um, congratulations on the positive results. Um, these tests were never designed to compare districts, but if they were, it would look pretty doggone good. Uh, so thank you for all you do there. Thank you for staying today as long as you did, because I know your day started very early this morning. They're going to start early tomorrow morning. So thank you very much for coming in here tonight, basically for all the time that you spend with kids. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a practical person. I'm not a theory person. I, and I can tell you right now that theory behind state tests is to make sure or to see how the kids are doing. Okay, and that sounds pretty good. And we're supposed to use the results to drive instruction. And again, that all sounds pretty doggone good. Alright, so I don't have a beef with that. I guess my concern comes in, and I'm probably out here by myself on a limb, but we, our most valuable resource in Reaper Creek is our people. You, our classroom teachers, everyone that's working with kids, they are our most valuable resource. So when are the people in Columbus going to finally realize that we do not need to take weeks or months out of our school year letting our most valuable resource, our, our most valuable resource, which is our folks, I proctor uh, and prepare our for these tests. Let our people do what we do best, which is teach. But thank you for what you do. <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank Lisa Walk for a comment about remembering that they're people, because you know you hear from people in the community, they see a result and they see a B, and to them, you know, well, of course we should be an A, and you know they don't understand the components of that and all of the things you just explained. I barely understand, and I heard it all. So you know it's. It's interesting to hear people in the community say we should have this score or that score, but um, remembering that there are kids behind those scores, remember the teachers behind those scores, and having the unique perspective that I have as having kids in our district now, the buildings they have been in, I know that they were seen as people first and as four second. Um, and so that has always been evident to me before I was on the board. Um, every teacher they've had has always come to me with you know, the good and the bad or the challenges with them as a person and not always first so um, I think that's testament to your leadership as administrators and, and you know reminding your staff that there's 
those are kids, not just scores that go on the review. So um, I want to thank you as, from a parent perspective for that. And, um, just try to encourage you that parents see what you're doing, um, even when some naysayers in the community don't. So thank you for all you do. And the one thing I loved when I heard is that I don't know how to do that yet. I love that because, you know, kids have to learn. As a teacher, I know where you are every day. I know what those teachers go through every day. You know, when I hear people say, oh, these scores should be better, I want to say, come walk in these teachers' shoes. You're not there with those kids every day. They are breaking their backs day and night. I know what teachers go through. They're home trying to figure out, how can I get this kid from point A to point B? And what people don't understand is, if you get this kid from A to B, that is a great progress. Some of these kids, they're lucky they get from point A to B during the year. And people don't understand what a great accomplishment that is. I want you to go back to your schools and tell your teachers, they are amazing people. We are a family. And no matter what, we are Beaver Creek. And we are the best. And I can say this because I know it. I know you. God bless you all. I wish I could talk. <laughs> my husband is thrilled. Just, just that we're getting lucky. Thank you all. I know all the work you put into this tonight was unbelievable. Seriously, I want to copy this. So it's really stuck. But thank you all for everything you do. I don't have to thank you enough. And with that, I'm Can I just, can I just ask one question? Go for it. On your 50th wedding anniversary, we which we recently celebrated, could you talk then? No! No, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we just came back from Vegas, and I was like this all week. So what can I say? I wasn't like, what you say? Okay, we're good. So I need a motion and a second to go into executive session for For the appointment, right? employment, dismissal, discipline, promotion, promotion, or compensation of public employees, 121.22 G1. So, okay. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Arnold. Yes. Yes.